Larry Gottheim. Is that pronounced right? Yes, it is. Thank you. It is January 21st, 2013. It is a pleasure and an honor. The first question is, what is the best thing for a human being? Well, I don't know if I can evaluate things in that order, saying this is the best. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things yeah. that are good. To feel in tune with nature and with other people. I like that. That's fine. In tune. Larry, what is your favorite form of information? Intuitive. Intuitive. I love that word. Why do you think humans gather or collect information? Well, partly it's practical because they need to solve different kinds of problems and they use information, but also it's a thing that they do together, so it's um, bonding also. Very good. I love that. Do you think this need or want to collect information is hardwired or is it something we learned? Well, I don't like hardwired just because I think that the hum human organism is similar to machine things, but it's the, it's not quite the same. So that talking about hardwired or all that kind of language is too mechanical. How about innate? Or in, is it in yeah. our DNA? Is it in our DNA to collect information, or is it something we learn? I think it probably is. I mean, yeah. even animals will explore their uh, yeah. where they are. So that's yeah. Uh, although I, you know, obviously everybody knows that the amount of uh, innate things in animals is much stronger. A lot of their whole lives are devoted to innate things that they do, like birds migrate right. because they figured out that that's a good thing to do. But because it's in their system to do it, whereas humans have, are more open to things that they can find out. Yeah. Very good. Um, I also think that information, I mean, we can get into that later because it's yeah. by films, but I think that there's different levels of what information is. So some information is not the deepest kind of knowledge yeah. that there is. Very good. Now, you use that word intuitive. I wanted to go back to that for one second. Do thoughts create emotions? Well, for a long time, I, I was like reading Heidegger without you know, having the technical knowledge to really get it on the deepest philosophical thing. But uh, it sort of coincided with some things I had been thinking about in terms of my films. And he has a lot of things about what is thinking. And he uh, opens up the idea that thinking is not the same as uh, what most people think of thinking. I mean, sort of like the thought when people are talking to each other and blah, 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 and they're saying, uh, you know, what do you think about uh, uh, Obama's second term? What do right. you think about this football game? That all of that stuff is not really thinking, and that thinking is something deeper, so that a word like intuition um, has more closer to the area of thinking that I'm thinking thinking is. <laughs> You're my kind of thinking, man. That was beautiful. Um, does the brain more detect consciousness or create consciousness? Well, sometimes the brain uh, overwhelms consciousness. I mean, there's something that's uh, personal to me, is even from what we were talking about, about my life and so on, is that I felt that a part of me that was being so-called smart was a kind of like defense. 
and that I was like achieving something because I wasn't like as a kid I wasn't achieving something with sports or with this or that so that my weapon was being kind of smart in a certain stupid way and then I began to feel after a while that um, uh, that was covering up things that were deeper and actually a lot of my film practice has to do with coming up with things that are uh, smarter than me or what I can have access to. That's why uh, I don't like or I don't think I could make like narrative film or conventional narrative films or documentary films because they start out with an idea. This is what I want. You know, that's what people a ask you normally. What are you trying to say? What, you know, what's your theme? Mm -hmm. And um, once you have that as what's dictating what you're doing, you're limited by that brain thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what I like to do, and I think I do do it, is by getting into certain kind of uh, problem that I'm trying to solve with something that I'm trying to do with film, I end up making something which, to my amazement, is way more interesting and profound than what I could have said starting out with. Very good. Cause and actually, as you know, my, um, well, my son, I have a son with a Haitian mother that I don't know, whose name is Hand. And also my uh, photography thing is called Be Hold which has to do with be and hold. It's partly having to do with things that you hold, but uh, something that Heidegger said that registered with me is uh, that the basis of thought is in your hand rather than in your brain. God, that's, that's almost McLuhan asked. McLuhan said TV is tactile. Right. <laughs> basis of thought is in your hand. Is that what he said? Something like yeah. that. Yeah. All right. That was beautiful. Well, you anticipated this question because I'm going to jump to it. A screenwriting teacher told me that a great film is when you can clearly see the intention of the maker. In talking with many filmmakers about this, one said, well, Kubrick says the opposite. A great film or a great piece of art is when you can clearly not see the intention of the maker. What role does intention play in your creative process? Well, sometimes intention is what uh, gets you going. Yeah. In other words, you have to have something, you know, in fact, it's very, um, uh, well, everybody knows this about art, is that you start out with nothing, and you wait for something to come, and then, and then maybe there are these different ideas that sort of pass before you, but they don't ignite anything. Right. And all of a sudden, something gets ignited, and you start to do something. Yeah. So maybe intention is, um, I mean, there's, there's time, different times, you have a different intention. So you start, at, at least with my kind of film, where I'm pretty much doing it by myself. Yeah. So you start out with something that gets you going to do something. And yeah. as you're into it, you're deeper, it, you have another different kind of intention and then when you're finally saying I I am I finished have is it good so that you keep changing it now I think that with the unwieldy thing of people like let's say making feature films where you've got to get a cast together and you've got to get people to put up the money and so on you can't do it that way but I think that the films that I love uh, in the feature film world have a kind of openness where uh, you feel that once the, the once you're into the project, that's why, for example, with Nick Ray's films, you feel that they kind of go off and things happen within them that he never could have anticipated in the beginning, yeah. and that that's really what the film is about, or yeah. it's, it's what's the deepest thing about. So that, for example, there is a level of, let's say, in Rebel Without a Cause, that's dealing with misunderstood children by their parent, whatever. But that's not really the whole thing that he's trying right. to do. That's almost like the pretext for making the film. Yeah. Or we call it sometimes the meta level. Uh -huh. Yeah. Very good. Um, 
Can you conjure up your earliest memory? Again, no. I have some early memories. Can you conjure up one of your earliest memories? Okay, a memory is different from dreams. Yeah. So I was thinking of earlier. Right now, I can't. Do you think memory is more a curse or more a blessing? You know, I have a film called Nemosyne, Mother of Muses, which means, again, that I don't want to, I mean, I'm coming out with all this Heidegger. I'm not so much into this anymore, right. but uh, that's something that I read that he was talking about, why it was that um, for the Greeks, the Nemosyne, the, the goddess of memory, was actually the mother of the nine muses. And so he speculates like why memory was thought of as the mother of muses. That's amazing. I didn't know that. Um, In fact, I'm showing that film. Very good. Can you just tell me one of your early role models within your immediate family and one outside your immediate family and what specifically you got from them? Just briefly. I mean, well, my mother's father, my grandfather, yeah. was a kind of impish person. And I can't quite explain, I mean, I think about it once in a while, I can't quite explain things specifically in my life now or uh, in my films or anything yeah. that really directly, I can't see a direct connection, but sometimes I think about it because now I'm the age that he was right. later in life. When I was a kid, right. he was my age. Right. You know, so I, I try to think of that, like what do I have of him yeah. now? Yeah. But he had, I mean, it's th different in a way, yeah. he had a cane, yeah. kind of like Charlie Chaplin, yeah. and um, we would go for like long walks and so he was important in my Beautiful. life. Beautiful. You know how often I get grandparents? A lot. Right. It's amazing. People go, well, of course, my parents, but it was my grandparents. Yeah. So, but I don't know that I'm like that. I have yeah. now grandchildren. Yeah. I don't know I'm going to visit. Them, but right. I feel like my life is way unconventional. So yeah. I'm not, yeah. uh, I don't have the same role yeah. uh, you know, that went in different directions. And Larry, thank you. How about outside your immediate family, and if not early in your life, any time in your life, were there any major role models or people who made a big impact on you, and what specifically would you say that impact was? Impact or influence? Well, I was really lucky. Um, in my immediate family, except for this thing with my grandpa, yeah. I didn't have consciously so much, even with my own parents. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of like estranged from my parents. Yeah. And was almost like out of, because when I went to this high school, I was already, the high school was in the city. Uh -huh. I traveled like an hour, over an hour to get there. Yeah. My friends were all far away. So I was almost like out of the family already when I was like 12 years old. Uh -huh. And, uh, but my clarinet teacher Okay, we went away. My parents were both uh, school teachers, so they had uh, the summer free. And the one thing that they did that I really appreciated, like we lived in this terrible neighborhood in Queens where it was always fighting, and it was like, uh, I think they were sim sympathizing with the Nazis during the uh, uh -huh. war. But uh, in the summer, we went away to this place in Vermont that was like very remote. Right. Uh, and uh, there were other school teachers from New York that had this little, these little shacks almost, right. like on my Champlain. But there was a kid that was older than me who played the clarinet. Uh -huh. And that's probably why I played the clarinet. Yeah. He was like a real, literal role model. Yeah. And so I started to take clarinet lessons from the teacher that was his clarinet teacher. And uh, this teacher came, d didn't have any money, he came to our house in Queens to give me this lesson. Uh, but after, pretty soon, uh, I would go to 
on Saturday morning and to take lessons. Right. And he lived on the Lower East Side in this like sixth floor uh -huh. walk up, this little right. one room thing uh, where he had a piano uh -huh. and uh, I would arrive and he and his wife were still sleeping on the floor in the living room and it was surrounded by books. Wow. And all these books were uh, books that I then learned the names of these like French poets and other stuff from him. And uh, so he taught you more than he taught yeah. me a lot. Yeah, right, right, he teaches right. symbolists. Well, he taught me enough to no, uh, no, and yeah. also he gave me, I think, already a. Um, he was into the avant garde of music. Gotcha. And so I already had a disposition to be open to. Uh, sort of far out music. Very good. That was perfect. Were you raised a particular religion? Um, I was, uh, my, this grandfather, my ancestry was Jewish. Yeah. And so in that generation of my grandparents, um, I was, uh, you know, they celebrated Jewish things. Right. To visit family. And then my parents mistakenly pushed me Forward. This is one of the really sad things in my life, is that, uh, and this had to do with this intelligent whatever, is that they had these age cutoffs to mm -hmm. move from a kindergarten to the first right. grade and, and so on. And so uh, uh, I was short of the age to move forward. And my parents were wanting to push me forward. So they took me out of the public school and sent me to this religious school yeah. for like maybe two years. It was like a small, it wasn't really school. So then I was able to return to the public school and be in the grade that they thought I, I was in. Uh, I think that was a terrible error because I was then always younger. I mean, I, I never was the right age right. for like half of my life. I was embarrassed. I would go out with girls that were older. Uh, gotcha. My friends were older. Yeah. I was embarrassed that I was uh, younger. And then all of a sudden, I was too old. And I was like, right. um, uh, so I never was the right age. But uh, uh, so my religious life was up to when I had my bar mitzvah when I was like right. 12 or 13. And, uh, but by that time, I was already lost contact with Judaism and never, um, right. never returned to it, never was gotcha. interested in it. Although I had different uh, spiritual things. Um, I was going out with this Quaker girl, oh. and I was thinking about that. Uh, recently, the most recent thing is I got very involved with voodoo. I did this whole <laughs> project and film that I'm working on still, hoping to finish it. Um, but I went to Haiti and uh, met this young girl who was very involved with voodoo. So for like a number of years, uh, I was really uh, involved with a lot of voodoo things. And uh, it's not all like sticking pins. Right. In, you know, it's a really deep thing. So I kind of thought that uh, a certain kind of religious fervor that had been part of my childhood thing was satisfied by that sort of wildness of the voodoo thing. And interesting enough, like Maya Deren was exactly. uh, also Jewish background, went to Haiti, <coughs> wrote, wrote, wrote a book. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. And so, uh, I mean, it wasn't, I, I connected with that a little bit, uh, although her experiences were different from mine, mm -hmm. but it was something that I could talk about because I couldn't explain why I was going to Haiti. Larry, let me ask you this question because it leads to it. Do evil people exist or does evil use people as a vehicle? I think evil people exist. How would you advise someone to deal with an enemy? And I'll just set it up with a few modern thinkers' thoughts. Alan Watts says, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Coppola stole from the mob and the samurais. Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Morphed into the word frenemies. JFK says, forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. 
Fellini says, I need an enemy. And lastly, Chinese proverb goes, he who cannot agree with their enemy will be controlled by them. Now, it's a lot of thoughts. The basic question is, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? But just before you start, how would you specifically react to Alan Watts if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them? I think that that's true. I mean, I, and actually, in, in my life right now, I have a, a, a problem. Uh, okay, I, um, I have a son with this woman that I was talking about from uh, Haiti. Yeah. And he's, I've basically been raising him as a single parent, and he's had a kind of troubled childhood, and he has that real problem. In other words, when I think of myself right now, the word enemy doesn't really describe, I mean, at various times, but I mean, I don't really have enemies. I yeah. have people that, you have people that you don't like, yeah. that they do you harm, yeah. you don't think of, but he has enemies. Yeah. I mean, he has kids, you know, at yeah. 19, uh, and I do tell him that because it really works, is that when they, like, taunt him mm. or do something to him, I tell him to ignore it because by, um, thinking that you're going to be tough against them, you are really empowering them. You're so I think that's really true. Yeah. It's amazing. <coughs> that was good. James Joyce was the first projectionist in Dublin just right. over a hundred years ago. Yeah. Basically checked out. He says, I'm out of here. This is stupid. Why should I go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when I can go outside and see a real tree? Right. Faulkner years later said, sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism. Why do we as humans have to recreate things in order to get them? In other words, why do we have to go to a theatrical play of people acting out life? Why don't we right. just live life? Right. Well, that's a pretty good question. Uh, but it seems like imitating is, uh, again, maybe an innate things that the cave people were... I mean, somehow, not everybody does that. It seems like within any given group of people or society or whatever, there's some people who feel moved to make images. And also even religion, a lot of religion grows out of that, making images of things, of dealing with images. It seems to be an interesting, I mean, it's a deep thing that you just asked. There. Very good. Lewis Hines published photos of child labor in printed matter. Yes. Culture historian says that was the tipping point to change laws. Upton Sinclair book, right. The Jungle, tipping point. Right. Leonard Cohen says, I want a poem that will change laws, right. make laws. Now, the thing is, is this question is specific. It means you know there's a lot more that changed the laws. It's a zeitgeist. But we want to pinpoint it as a tipping point. Yeah. The question is, any theater, music, art, or film that actually was the tipping point to change a law, and you know, the sort of hidden meta levels, is it still possible to have the same kind of impact with these other art forms that printed matter prove that that can change a law, you know? Right. I don't know. I think that it can change a person. I don't know if it could change a law. Yeah. Good. And and somehow, I don't know, we live, maybe it's always been a bad time. We live in a bad time because, uh, let's say, the kind of works that we might personally feel have changed us and maybe changed also people that we know or whatever, Ulysses yeah. or whatever you want to say, Fellini. Yeah. Um, most of the people, let's say, in the United States, don't even know they're watching football. Right. They're not, so that those works, that, I mean, maybe there were societies where the great works were more spread out, and, um, but nowadays it seems like there's no contact that most people have, most people in the United States don't have any contact with art on a kind of deep way or 
Yeah. Very good. And I'll take it right to the next step is we've had a slew of political docs over the last 20 years, lots of them. Sean Godard at the Cannes Film Festival went up to Michael Moore when Fahrenheit 9-11 premiered and goes, this film's going to help Bush get elected. Right. <laughs> now, it didn't help, per se, Bush right. get elected, but it galvanized pro-Bushers. Right. So the bottom line question is, do you think these political documentaries more activate or more pacify people? Well, I actually think that a lot of those films... Uh, here's the McLuhan thing. is I, th I, I think that the mode of the film is more uh, influential than the content of the film. So that a lot of films that have, they're all for freedom, they're all for the good things, they're all for everything, but in their mode of thing, it's like, f f for example, Michael Moore's films. Michael Moore is like a dictator. He's a, uh, uh, <coughs> he uses film in a closed way instead of an open way. You watch Michael Moore's films, uh, or as an example, I mean, standing yeah. for all those films, yeah. <coughs> he's not helping you to be open to experience things in an open way. He's helping you to experience things in a closed way, yeah. in the way he, so, so that it's not that different from advertising. <laughs> so it's like the yeah. um, Trojan horse. He sneaks it into you yeah. because it seems to be for a good cause. Yeah. So you lap it up, and meanwhile you're you're being programmed, just as he has been yeah. programmed. Yeah, that was well put. <coughs> um, and it's interesting because uh, you know D. W. Griffith said in 2014, which is next year, cinema will end war. And it's like with all this Argo and. Catherine Bigelow's film with the CIA yeah, climbed down. Right. It's like, and then just what, two months ago, a 14 minute film, they did say that caused warfare across the, Amer across the world, you know, because it was dissing Mohammed. Oh, right, that thing. Yeah, yeah that thing. It was like, it caused war. Right. And it's like, geez, D.W. Griffin right. might be right next year. We can end war with film. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny because you bring up like the pop culture thing just a moment ago. And I, I always use Avatar as an example. <laughs> What's the biggest event in the history of cinema? Avatar. Yeah. What was it? Pro Mother Nature, anti the man, and anti war. Ask anybody coming out of the film, what'd you think? They right. go, good special effects. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> no. They don't go, well, let's end war now, no. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, that's like Sidney Lumet saying, well, film can't do diddly squat, but it doesn't keep <laughs> me from trying. Right. <laughs> then there's the real uh, puzzle of something like The Birth of a Nation. Which has such a bad, I mean, it's such a great film. Yeah. But it's also so terrible thing. Yeah. But maybe, um, well. Well, that, that's the example. I've had a historian tell me what, you know, uh, <coughs> film, theater, art, or music changed laws. He said, Birth of a Nation, it changed immigrant laws. And I goes, hmm, that's interesting. Could have. But um, Duchamp said, There's no art without an audience. What role does the audience play when you're making your film? Are you thinking about your audience? <coughs> well, I think that what I actually do is that I think of a sort of ideal audience, a fictitious imaginary audience. And that imaginary audience is in tune with me so that I put things in there I'm like giving the audience, I'm like creating experience for that audience. And I put something over here because the, that will, the audience will remember it later and think of this. The actual audience very rarely actually um, is like that. Well, that's interesting because it's a funny thing Duchamp said that. There's no, there's no art without an audience. Well, guess who's the first audience in any art piece? Right. The maker. Yeah. But, you know, I always said, could you make a piece of music without hearing it? Yeah, right. So you make, like, could you make a film without ever seeing it? <laughs> yeah. Can't really no. do it, you know. Right. Well, but, some, but, you know, what, where, what's funny is that sometimes in a screening, uh, you have the feeling of, it's like quiet. 
and everybody's yeah. seeming to be with it. Yeah. And that, then you feel, wow, this is really the audience. I mean, yeah. they're really having the experience that yeah. I want them to have. Then they ask a question, and you realize, oh shit, you know, they. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the intuitive in the air, it right. feels like they're getting it. Or else it's yeah. something completely. Yeah. I, I remember that um, uh, when I first had these shows in Europe, and I went to yeah. England, and uh, I, because of those early films like uh, uh, Fog Lines, yeah. they sort of had me pegged. Like, right. This is what he's doing. He's doing. And yeah. then I came back. And I still remember, uh, I won't mention the name, but I had a screening uh, uh, in the class of somebody who was like a big cheese in that world of independent you know, experimental film in yeah. London. And the screening room had, and this is my film Horizons. Which right. Was like when, anyway, the screening room had an elevator that opened up onto the floor. Right. And like people were going up to him like they would come out of the elevator yeah. and they would be like coming up to him and asking him a question and, and so I mean it was clearly how could he conceivably even have any idea what was the really inner thing of what this film could yeah. offer yet he had a whole opinion about it yeah you know yeah. because he didn't doesn't he didn't even know yeah or couldn't even imagine and so I realized that Again, somebody like that, it's not actually enemy, but those people are close to the enemy. Yeah. Like the people who uh, are just on such a different wavelength, and when it enters into your deepest world, yeah. and you realize that they're, it's like a betrayal. They're yeah. Amazing. Well put. Larry, what first attracted you to pursue filmmaking? When, at what point did you go, well, oh, I can do that? Like, what caused it? A person, a film? What was that turning point where you go, oh, I can do that? Well, as I said, it sort of came upon me. You know, I had uh, uh, suppressed or moved away from, like, music, literature, whatever, but maybe something was coming out. And I don't know, because it took me a while to um, find what I was looking for. I mean, it wasn't so long. I mean, I was lucky because in some way, all... Okay, let me go on to a little longer thing. Sure. Is that I was embarrassed when I started to get to know these film people that uh, many of them had coming out of painting or coming out of uh, visual art. You mean er, the early experimental filmmakers you were hanging with were coming out of painting? Right. Yeah. And so I felt that, uh, first of all, I was um, coming out of, like, literature seemed like, oh, shit, you know, this is like, uh, i got to get away from that. For, uh, now, I, you know, that changed, but I felt that a lot. Also, I was their age, or older, or younger, but... They were already master, or they were already making films, whereas I was just like starting. But it because everything that I did before actually was preparing me because you know you can. I was a fast developer. It took me like a couple of years to find my way to the yeah. kind of films that then was I started to, yeah. to do. So that when I felt, first felt the calling to make films uh, or to you get a camera, like I didn't think I want to become a filmmaker, but I'd like to get a camera and see what that's about. Somehow the depth of that calling was not realized in that the first things that I started to do were sort of fumbling and way off base from what, not way off, but you know, that yeah. weren't, it wasn't what I, Yeah. but I was lucky to have found the thing with those early films like Blues and Foghorn that led me all the way through till today. Beautiful. Now McLuhan says everything we invent extends some human part of us. So clothing extends our skin, knife and fork extends our teeth, blinking extends is, an, is a way we uh, 
we use film editing extends blinking, let's say. What does the, the moving image camera, whether it's a film or a video, what humanness does it extend for you? Human sensorium, you'd say, what does it extend? Well, for me, in the beginning, it was extending, I would say, consciousness. I mean, now, with all this thing with the hand, I had a lot of uh, trouble with that hand mm -hmm. uh, because um, <coughs> the big powerful example, the figure that was so powerful also in that early time and for everybody who was in, was Brackage. And Brackage was all about uh, the camera movement as an extension of the eye and the hand, or the eye and the arms that are holding the camera. Uh, so what did I start to do is static camera. <laughs> and it was actually a very big, and then when there started to be movement, it was uh, not expressive movement, but let's say the car moving, or yeah. moving in some way that um, it took me a long time to get into the camera movement. And then when I did it, it was really moving it, moving yeah. it in a really erratic way. So, um, but I also felt that the, uh, it was almost like, um, you know, the early theories of vision where the vision seemed to be coming from your eye rather than coming into your eye. And I felt that always in the early films, or even in all the films, is, but especially in the early films, that when I was looking through the camera, I, I became transformed. I felt like I was, um, the thing that was unfolding in front of the camera was partly coming out of me. Mm -hmm. Too bad the audio can't see what you just <laughs> did with your hands, because that was communicated with words and gesture, but it was sort of really good how you showed the gesture of what was coming out of you. So, <clears throat> that was very good. Peter Greenway says that, that cinema is much too rich a medium to be left to storytellers. Now, I, I'm not trying to make a value judgment, storytelling is good or bad, right. but the question is, are experimental filmmakers telling stories a different way or doing something completely different? For instance, I always say Tony Conrad's a flicker. Well, it's storytelling when we're watching it because we, so we might have a story go through our head. Right. But in essence, that really isn't storytelling per se. But yeah. you, you get the gist of the question, basically. Right. Yeah. Well, I do think of that a lot in the kind of structures that I think of. I mean, there's got to be something that makes you want to turn the page, so to speak. I mean, you've got to have something that makes you... Uh, I mean, a lot of the structures that I have, that I find most interesting, are ones where when the film is in the latter part of the film, you're in a whole thing that you never anticipated that you're in, but it's kind of like it's almost like climactic. Even nothing is, it seems like even, yet if you're really into it, it's thrilling in the same way that, uh, you know, those Griffith things where all these different chases and all these yeah. things are happening. It's like exciting. So it's not exciting in that way, but if you're inside the film, it's like, holy shit, you know, it's like you, you have some kind of feeling that you've been brought someplace and so that also is, is important in terms of what I'm saying, is that you have to be able to be feeling, paying attention, in, in enjoy, enjoying paying attention from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You have to be engrossed in it. Mm -hmm. And then, so then you'll be able to have this experience later on. I mean, if you're like talking to somebody or just like checking Cas it out. Casually. There's yeah. nothing going to be happening. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what... <clears throat> has happened is that we become more casually consuming anything right. and and it is hard for to 
really grab someone and say, could you pay attention for right. a couple that's of minutes? Right. That's right. <laughs> and so a lot of the music, I mean, a lot of the technique of conventional cinema and even of certain other kind of cinema is you you push people into paying attention. You, yeah. Yeah. You control. Well, that, that perfectly leads into this because Michael Apted's getting all his press this week with his new uh, 56 and Up film coming out. And um, I asked Michael Apted about 30 years ago, I said, why do rock video makers feel so obliged to edit fast? This was 30 years ago when MTV first came out. Marty Scorsese says, I cut my films faster because of MTV. Mm-hmm. And so Apted said, well, that's because we've learned to take in information faster. Yeah, right. So the way I phrase this question is definitely slamming, but I say, can we actually learn to take in information faster, or are we just brainwa- brainwashed be- to believe we can? Well, it's a big issue for me because my early films are very slow. Yeah. Or they seem to be very slow unless you are into it in a yeah. way. But then I got into very fast. Uh huh. Fast editing, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So you think humans can learn to take in information faster? Well, I wonder about that because it's such an important part of my thing. So I try to be, um, I used to do these things of classes where you would have to come in, like turn on the TV and take something, like it it can't be longer than a minute. It's like 20 seconds of something. And then we look at it and you try to think of, evaluate it. Uh So like if, somebody has, let's say, a fast-moving commercial, and you just take, like, 20 seconds of it, and you look at it and try to say, can you actually see into it the shallowness of it? Uh And I don't know. Sometimes there are things that happen in a commercial, very rarely, where I really like it. I really think that there's some kind of editing that's... um, I get a kick out of it. Yeah. So that sometimes they really learn, and it really is beautifully edited. Uh-huh. So I do try to do that with yeah. commercials or with movies. Yeah. You try to think, right. let me just try to think, is this really edited in a beautiful way yeah. or is it a, some cheesy thing right. that they're doing? And sometimes things, um, I'm surprised there's like an ad for this rug thing. It's like, you know, you buy this rug and we'll install the rug in your whole house. Right. And there's this kind of cartoon guy at the end and he goes and he looks at you and there's the sound thing with it, and I really like it. It's like better than what you see, and even in a lot of experimental films, there's something that they really caught the yeah. gesture, and it's really good. Yeah. So again, in this fast thing, I don't know. Yeah. Are people actually seeing? Sometimes it's off. Like you feel like yeah. the editor didn't really even think about it they just like do it fast yeah but it's a good question I don't know yeah well um the the hidden question really is too the popular term now is multitasking is it literally possible for humans to multitask well this is a deep thing for me too this is a very important question because um I'm interested. Okay, I'm interested in things that are at the edge of your uh, ability to like remember. Like, let's say, in, let's say listening to music. There's a lot of music where you can't really follow it because it's beyond your ability to really hold on to the structure of it. Like, that's even why I like some of the Schoenberg and some of these really difficult things. You know, imagine those forms where things are going forward and backward, even in a simple way. Like, can you really, if I play something on the piano and then I play it backwards or upside down, can you really hear it? I mean, those guys could, but if I'm, like, paying attention and I'm really listening to it, it's... I can't get it. Yeah. But it's an interesting, it's interesting to be in that space where 
you're fascinated, but you can't really get it. You realize yeah. that it's beyond yeah. you. Uh, whereas I think in a lot of these fast... Uh, okay, well, say the question again, because I don't want to lose the thing, because it's a good question. Is it literally possible for humans to multitask? I hate... I mean, when you're really attentive... You can't. I do think that this multitasking yeah. is a way of preventing focus, yeah. attention. It, it, everything you said reminded me of a great little uh, title Zappa puts in the middle of one of his TV shows. He goes, this is beyond the fringe of audience <laughs> comprehension. Right, right. <laughs> so he actually tells you right. what you're doing when you're here in Schoenberg, right. who had right. influence on Frank, right. and it's like, this is it. It's right. beyond your fringe of the audience comprehension. Right. <laughs> okay, we'll just switch the tape here. That was really good. Let's just... Here, this, this is completely so different from what I expected. Uh, it's really interesting. You're acquired something yourself. Well, thank you, Larry. It is an honor to have you. No, come okay, on. and, and this, these are my key questions we're right in the midst of. If you and I were starting the Ann Arbor Film Festival, it would be 51 years ago, with George Manupelli, would you want it to be more inclusive or more exclusive? And let me just tell you, keep in mind, that basically the festival features a fraction of animation, a fraction documentary, and the majority of it is experimental. Chick Strand was starting Canyon Cinema the same time in San Francisco with Bruce. She told me that she was try they were trying to recreate their 11 cent movie going experience. So she would say, well, we show a newsreel, a cartoon, and then add an experimental film. Mm -hmm. Brackage came along and says, don't show the other stuff. They already have a venue. Right. Just show experimental. So, you know, the, the bottom line question is, should we be inclusive or exclusive? Yeah, when we were doing the film society, I hated this idea of a short. The short, the word short, yeah, is like so stupid. And also, the short is always frivolous. Yeah. So, I mean, now I have to say that when you asked before about what not thing, I mean, there were, I, I didn't. Once I did that first film festival, I wasn't paying so much attention. I mean, uh, I think I and, and I was judge of this. There was something called the Black Mariah Film Festival. Yeah. But uh, there was something, the, the, this was prejudice on my part, I yeah. believe, truly. But I did have that prejudice that there was something like a festival film. There was a certain kind of film that was designed to like win a prize at a festival. And that there was a certain kind of, there were certain hooks into it, like an audience appeal that would be popular to that audience. And that's why I didn't feel that my films would be festival films. Now, I realize that many films that were entered into festivals and won prize of film were wonderful films that I really love, so I don't mean blanket. Yeah. But, but I did have that prejudice about it. Yeah. So I would want to do something that didn't have that element. I mean, maybe that element of the audience thing was... something that I didn't agree with that because it had the people who were the audience of the festival were I don't know what they were looking for yeah it's almost like uh, the Academy Award I mean who yeah. cares who won the Academy yeah. Award it's so uh, meaningless really uh, so again who won the, a certain yeah. film festival award is also kind yeah. of meaningless but it what you're talking about is there's a lot because after going to Ann Arbor for many years, I goes, I could write a book called How to Make the Perfect Student Short. Yeah. First of all, just put Bernard Herrmann soundtrack <laughs> right. and do this and do that, right. and then boom, you got this right. certain hook. Right. But and it still happens. Now you got the other thing like Brian Konevsky does in New Mexico now, which is sort of like Ann Arbor Film Festival in the early years, and he calls it experiments in cinema. Oh. And so 
if it's experimental film, cinema, then it shouldn't have a Wikipedia entry because you can't right. you can't right. explain what experiments are. Right. But now it's a genre. It's called right. oh well, it's usually done by one person. Well, right. that's sort of accurate. Right. It's usually non-narrative right. or this and that. Right. And so now you define it. Right. Well, then it's no longer exactly. experiment, right? right. You, right. You've defined it. So right. that's it's a tough call. Yeah. But it's more like should we be inclusive? Because we're like, well, we're just showing experimental. No, let's be inclusive. That's exclusive. Let's be inclusive. We show Betty Boop, Hitchcock, and right. uh, Bruce Connor. Right. And so then, isn't that a better world where you you form an aesthetic? So yeah, uh, no, I think that's true. I yeah, like that. but let let me explain the next question. It sort of susses it out farther. What are the services and disservices of ghettoizing experimental film or marginalizing it? Jackson Pollock was on the cover of Life magazine in 49. Regular people in America could form an aesthetic on experimental painting. Right. They go, oh, I like that. My kid could do that. Yeah. Bruce Conner and Maya Darren weren't on the cover of Life magazine. Right. So generally, it's privileged, or I call them rich art kids, who develop an avant-garde aesthetic and dominate the experimental film world. Yeah. Anything, any comments? Well, there is something about... Uh, the power of the movies is so great and the power of movie making like there's a there certainly is an erotic element in movie making and that time when I was making I mean that uh, even those films like Adar and, and to, you know and they had these actresses who were right. uh, you could fall in love with them. Oh, hello, you yeah. Know, Bridget Bardot. And, right, and, and then all that stuff. And, so, and then, actually, uh, the audience, uh, a lot of the big audience for, like, those Bruce Conner films, you know, was because there was nudity when you couldn't see any yeah. kind of nudity, whatever. So once the erotic element was, uh, or the conventional erotic element, either male or female, yeah. Because a lot of those early experimental films were either gay oriented or nude, female nudity yeah. or something. Once those were removed, then there was a conflict between what people wanted to experience in the movies, to go to the movies, and then you were taking it away from them, like having them go to the movies and see some kind of like formal thing. They didn't like it, they hated yeah. it. Uh, whereas it wasn't so much like, I don't know, like Jackson Pollock wasn't in conflict with uh, the Saturday Evening Post cover. Right. I mean, it, it, they were in such different worlds that nobody felt that you would, if you looked at, although people were making fun of it. Yeah. It, but somehow the movie, because you have to sit there also in. Um, like video is more popular than movie experimental film because video is often shown in like there's a monitor here, a monitor there. You can walk around like in a museum, look at this, walk yeah. up, you don't have to see it to the right. end. Whereas in the movie thing, you gotta sit there in the yeah. dark, it's intimidating. Yeah. Uh, the, when is this ever gonna end? You know, like it's uh, so there's something different about film movie thing. From other arts, I yeah, think. it's interesting too because that's the, you know, if you're a poet or experimental filmmaker, you can't make a living doing it right. in general, right. and um, so you got to teach, right. or that's one of your main the main thing, right. and so you know it's uh, <clears throat> this whole phenomenon of uh, uh, you can make. There's a fine line between experimental film and video installation. So I've, I've had this line right. where, you know, all you got to do is call your experimental film video installation <laughs> and you get paid. <laughs> it's true. You, it is true. Yeah. And some people go, no, that's not true. And other people go, yeah, that's true. All you got to do is say, oh, no, I'm a video installation artist. Right. Oh, you get paid. Right. No, but now <laughs> you, it's ridiculous. I mean, you almost have to give up. I mean, I, I was surprised when I started to make 
uh, these DVDs because it's hard, you know, to make these DVDs. It's expensive yeah. to do it. And then I thought, well, you know, how many of them would I have to sell in order to become to make a profit? Right. Well, it would be like a thousand. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, good you, luck. Right. You know, yeah. Oh, they sell for like five dollars. Right. Know, give it away. Oh right. yeah. Well, that's it. Um, film as an art form has been swindled by capitalism. I'm not saying I agree or disagree. I'm just saying that's a line. Any comment? I don't know. You are a little bit... I mean, the, the underground film thing was anti the industry. I mean, like you... 60 millimeter film wasn't expensive. Yeah. Uh, you weren't doing 35. I mean, I guess the the development of video was also that they all caught on and so that you would have these different formats and you have to buy a new camera and all that stuff uh, so that capitalism appropriates everything. I mean, it, even the most anti-capitalist thing, capitalism figures out how to make a commodity out of it. Or, good. or to... But I don't know. But a lot of film, I mean, they're really cla I guess we escaped, but then they killed it. They, um, you can't get film anymore. Yeah. Or the labs go out of business, so they crush it. If you succeed in having your films not co-opted by capitalism, then capitalism crushes you by not making film anymore. Or not caring about you. Amazing you said that because it's front page of LA Times today. Yeah. Drive ins are screwed because wow. they can't, they got to go digital and they're like, yeah. whatever. But that's an amazing comment because someone I was intrigued about that we have in common that oh. affected us early understanding what experimental oh. film is, Andy Warhol. Right. Either he said it or one of his associates said it. There's nothing more bourgeois than dissing the, the bourgeois. Right. Or there's yeah. nothing more capitalistic than bu right. dissing the capitalists. I mean, some yeah. people are, have that ability of, like, very ironic. I mean, he certainly had that yeah. ability of seeming to, you know, when he started making those narrative films, then he had other people doing yeah. it. He out capitalists. The capitalists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think the motive of the cave artist was? You're asking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what, as I said before, there seemed to be some kind of human necessity yeah. to pictorialize yeah. things. And then again, with religion, you know, even if some anthropologists could figure out that these were had some kind of religious uh, meaning, yeah. but then you just go beyond that. So what was the point of that religious meaning, or how did religion yeah. arise, or whatever? Do you so. think the motive has changed, that artists still create for the same reason the cave artists created? Deep down, you know. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. Of, of course, we don't know. Um, like now, we're so aware of the multiple yeah. things that people produce. Yeah. With the cave artists, that's all we have. <laughs> so we don't know whether there was junky right. stuff that they were doing and that right. these were the right. great, these right. were Shakespeare's of... Um, of the cave art, yeah. yeah. Uh, Larry. And we tend to think about from ancient cultures, you know, like Greek, I mean, yeah. you know, Homer, I mean, like we think of these cultures where everybody was like listening to the Odyssey or yeah. you know, going to see, I mean, we don't know what it was really like. Yeah. Um, Larry, what's more important, conviction or compromise? Conviction. Although we have that thing with, um, in the politics now, like they're, they were saying that Obama it 
needs to be more of a master of yeah. compromise. Yeah. But now, do you think you got that answer, conviction, from the way you were raised, or got it on your own? Well, this goes back to some childhood things about my father. My father was somebody of high sort of moral ideals, but I felt that he was always weak. That his convictions were in his head, sort of. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a good person, but I don't know, I always felt like he was... Hmm. I wanted him to be stronger. Huh. Is ambition based more on fear or more on joy? You got really great questions. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, ambition is an interesting thing. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that again with my father. I mean, there, he didn't have ambition. I have this thing of, you know, sometimes with some people, ambition is joyful. You feel like even when you see somebody who's ambitious in a good way, you feel good about it. Yeah. But often when somebody's ambitious, it's like a negative thing, like they're self-promoting. Yeah. That's good. Let's go on. Is loyalty based on reason? Well, there's almost an, it's an... I feel with myself that I'm almost like a dog. You know, like if somebody is good to me, I'll always be loyal to that person. Yeah. And it's almost like an instinctive thing to be loyal to yeah. them. I mean, I don't think, oh, it's going to be right. a good idea to be loyal to this person. Yeah. T.S. Eliot said that poetry is outing your inner dialogue. What language is your inner dialogue in? Well, again, I think that the language inner dialogue, I try to go deeper than that. I mean, that's a lot yeah. of what my work is about. Because I do have, of course, thoughts in my head. But it's almost like, uh, I mean, this is a big issue for me. Yeah. Like when you're talking, even when we're talking right now. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like a sudden surprise. Like, you say something, and then I hear myself saying, this is the answer. Right. And it's not like I have these words, uh, like a few seconds before I'm uh, saying it, these yeah. words are going through in my mind. Um, like, thought is different from the words that are in your, in your mind. Uh, because sometimes I do have actually words. I mean, you, for example, I know that I'm going to have to uh, write somebody a letter or meet somebody. So yeah. you're kind of rehearsing. I mean, you do do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's not thought. Thought is something that doesn't have words yeah. to it. That's good because I usually say, what language is your inner dialogue in? Slash, what form is your inner consciousness in? Because it's easier for, it's easy for the person to go, what language is my inner dialogue in? English. Right. But I really want, is right. there something more than just yeah. English? Right. And uh, what you said to remind me of two things. T.S. Eliot said, when I talk to you, i got to use words. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know, we could just use gestures or we right. could have done this whole thing in dance. Right. But, but what, the, what I was thinking of, yeah. I mean, I'm going to talk, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this, because here I am sort of imagining what I would say about this program. Yeah. You know, but things that happen, like uh, I'm interested in whatever, taking a right. photograph, f f filming that thing, so you get the camera, you, right. put it, you, you put it here instead of there, yeah. and you do that, and you put that. I mean, all of that kind of fussing around is really thinking. I mean, that's really, you don't even realize it because you're, it seems so practical, so stupid, you know, you're putting the light there, but finally, the result of all of those little stupid things that you do is something that only you would have done and 
the process is. There's two other things you remind me of. McLuhan says, I don't know what I think until I've said it. Yeah, that's and Joan Didion says, I don't know what I think until I've written it. <laughs> so it's the process yeah. is the right. is the outing, right. sort of. And that leads to this. George Manupelli said, his sort of mantra is, ignore yourself. Jonas Meek has said just a couple of years ago here in L.A., he says, there's no self-expression <laughs> and the, Cecil Taylor, the great jazz pianist, says, yeah. I'm just a vehicle. This right. stuff just comes through me. Right. So this question is, is, is art making, filmmaking, more self-expression or more vehicles of whatever dominant technology or culture is presently cur- you know, occurring? Well, you want to defeat the flowing along with the current things. I mean, it's important to kind of have a great, like, Geiger counter to detect things that you're doing that are along the path of... I like that, a Geiger counter. Well, do you think art making can be egoless? Well... I mean, I'm drawn in different directions. Um, sometimes, like with John Cage or Duchamp or something, there, there's, and even with some of the early world, I mean, there are things that seem to be maybe not ego less, but they're not about yeah. the ego. So I guess it could be like that. But I know I was very moved. Today, actually, um, by um, there's a guy you know who's, who has he's been a, one of the earliest photography dealers, and he's a sort of friend. So he brought the work of there's this woman photographer, and I'm really amazed by her work. I was really um, I can't go into too much, mm-hmm. but I felt wow, this is the real deal. She mm-hmm. is really an embodiment mm-hmm. of what I think of as an. I mean, Mm-hmm. I don't feel that very much, mm-hmm. although I'm dealing with photography and there are things that I like. And I mean, it, uh, I'm not so crazy about most contemporary photography mm-hmm. or even people that I like. I like it, but it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Her work was like, uh, really, I was mm-hmm. I'm stunned by it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some other people were like, we put up stuff, yeah. and you could just tell that it was coming from such a deep level. It was both, but. I mean, she was, um, w- w- what she did, so I mean, I can yeah. go on to it for yeah. a long time, but what she did is, um, she had been a dancer, and but she has some kind of problem, she's, she's, she's been in pain for a lot, but she took these um, uh, images of herself, in not a pose of like an erotic pose, but of her body right. in some kind of position, and, then, and they were Polaroids, like little Polaroids, and then she was... Uh, like working on them f- for weeks, like painting on them, mm-hmm. scratching it, putting stuff on it, you know, building up, putting another layer, and then putting little pieces of the sand or stuff on it. And then finally, when she had this uh, thing, she would then photograph it. Mm. And so it had so much meaning. It was coming out of her pain mm-hmm. because she was in pain mm-hmm. a lot, her sense of herself and her yeah. body. and whatever. I mean, it was really deep. Yeah. So I don't think it was ego, ego-less, uh, but it wasn't self-promoting either. Gotcha. And I've had this yeah. trouble with a lot of the inspiring uh, people uh, that I've been close to, yeah. like Ken or Brackage yeah. or uh, Peter Cooper. I mean, a yeah. lot of those people are very, very, on a world level, strong uh, strong-willed people who need to have uh, a lot of people around them. Yeah. I mean, there's something scary about it. Yeah. Gotcha. That was, that was well done. Is perception reality? You mean what we perceive through our eyes? Yeah. Good question. 
<laughs> well, in one sense, we know how easily we could be deceived. Yeah. By, uh, whatever. So the question is, what is perception? I mean, there's yeah. different levels of perception. Uh, Let's say that there's a certain. Is it possible, with our perception, to perceive reality? Yeah. Let's say if there is reality, so yeah. can we? Or is it a goal to be yeah. able to perceive it? Well, you won because that's this whole interview is about inventing new questions. Well, and your question mm -hmm. was, if there is a reality, <laughs> is there reality? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're going around going right. thinking, we go, oh yeah, there's reality. <laughs> you know. Right. Um, McLuhan probed Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce saying, artist dream... Over. Sorry, i got to go back. Cause oh, no, go ahead. That, yeah, that go ahead. About reality, sure. I was thinking... That, um, I don't know, re remembering something that was an important issue where you talk about like an image like in the movies people take it often take it as an accepted fact that we know all about reality so that we can compare like the cinematic thing with reality right. but we really don't know what reality is right and, Right, yeah. So, um, McLuhan probed Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce, says, artists dream awake. We all have these creative uh, powers to create these scenarios in the middle of the night while we're dreaming. He says, well, artists also have that ability to dream while they're awake. Have, how have dreams played a role in your creative process? Well, not in a literal way. Like, I don't have a dream and then yeah. uh, um, try to... But there is a state that's like a dream that you, can, that you do get into. Yeah. I don't remember my dreams so much. I mean, some people say, oh, I yeah. had a dream, and then right. I went for an hour, like describing. Yeah. But it's very, very rare that that yeah. happens to me. And dreams are often narrative. You know, talk about narrative. Yeah. The dreams are, I mean, they're sort of crazy narratives, but they are yeah. narratives that involve people and situations yeah. and stuff. Good. Why is it so difficult for humans to consider the possibility that life may be pointless? Repeat, say that again. Why is it so difficult for humans to consider the possibility? that life may be pointless. I don't know. I wonder about that, about religion. Yeah. Because right now, we're in a very troubled thing in the world. Yeah. I mean, maybe it always was, but I mean, it seems to me that so much of the troubles, whether it's in the United States yeah. or of the world or everywhere, religion is somehow implicated in all of the yeah. terrible things. So we wonder... Why is it? What about? Uh, and actually, for myself, um, after this whole thing of voodoo and so on, yeah, I now feel like I'm out of religion. I yeah, mean, I'm, and I feel so liberated. Feel great. I feel like so. Wow. <laughs> <well. laughs> um. Lewis Carroll says, I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Have you believed in any impossible things lately? Hmm. Yeah, I suppose. Um, Can you name one? Or? Well, of course, everything that you want it turns out to be impossible. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Larry, you've been making films for many years. What elements of your filmmaking, or what one major element of your filmmaking has changed, and what one major element has remained the same? Well, um, as I said before, going from slow to fast, right. silent it's, to sound, yeah. uh, uh, content, which is uh, very minimal so that the 
statement about the content doesn't tell anything about the film yeah. to things with a sort of higher charged content. I think what I was going to talk about, because I, thinking about this program, mm -hmm. I mean, is that there always is a, a, a sort of like problem. So like I'm always busy solving some or setting myself a sort of problem in order to de defeat the willfulness uh, so that a lot of, like, just what happened is uh, I have all these films that have a kind of structure with repetition and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I've been really troubled about all of this uh, Haitian for I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it's been very difficult to actually form this thing into a finished film. Yeah. Actually, Maya Darren never did it. You know, she wrote a book about voodoo, but all of her footage was remain footage. Uh, but I finally found, just on the plane coming out here, I got it. You got an epiphany, right? right. Wow. So I got it thing. But I think the thing about the form is you you have to um, like I I was drawn to let's say formal poetry. Why is there, you could say that a formal structure is like um, a straitjacket. It prevents freedom. It, um, but on the other hand, the formal structure opens up the freedom because you've got to fit some, you've got to find the word that fits in over here. And so, you start thinking about these words, and then the word comes in there, and it's not the word that you thought of in the beginning when you were writing that poem. Yeah. It's the word that uh, suddenly you yourself are amazed at what you just wrote. Uh, so I like that um, element. That's uh, this guy um, nominated for an Oscar a couple of years ago, <coughs> studied with Brackage and Phil Solomon, uh -huh. and he's on the radio and he says, I learned from them that form should eliminate content. And I goes, that sounds like something I would say. And then I says, wait, I better check this out. And I Googled it, and he right. says, no, he learned that form should illuminate content. Uh -huh. And I goes, that's an easy thing to miss here on the right. on the radio. But yeah. but illuminate and eliminate. Oh, right. And it's like, yeah, oh, eliminate content. Right. <laughs> okay, that was great. Now, Moshe, <laughs> Moshe Feldenkrais works with healing and movement. And he says it's literally possible to identify a weakness and incorporate it to become a strength. Rather, we're taught to overcome a weakness. Can you tell me a weakness that you've incorporated to become a strength? Well, in the beginning, uh, this issue of passivity is important for me because I said about my father mm -hmm. and I feel like I have uh, one part of me has this kind of passivity and I've tried to um, use it make a strength out of it hmm good American Indians and Eastern culture respect their elders can you explain Western <laughs> culture's disdain for old age? Great question. I mean, there's an American thing of even earlier. I mean, more now, there's this sort of cult of youth and, um, yeah. you know, advertising, you know, how you look. I guess it's changing now that uh, obesity has become the norm of, you know, them. Yeah. <coughs> but America itself was founded as the young yeah. country. Uh, there's a lot of things in America. I mean, think of that through the photography. There, there's in the 19th century. There's this whole contradiction of. Like there was a veneration of George Washington, the father of our country, mm -hmm. but yet there also was this thing of young America, the youth, the, the new thing mm -hmm. in the world, old Europe, old yeah. everything, young America, yeah. this new thing. 
right? So it's not just today that there's this youth culture. Um, you mean it was in George Washington's time? Or at least yeah. in the early 19th century. Yeah, looking back. I see what you're saying. Yeah. That's interesting, um, yeah. But um, So I don't know whether it's part of the cultural background uh, of America. I certainly felt American... Like, when I was studying literature, music, all that stuff, even painting, it was always, like, uh, French painting, European this, you yeah. foreign movies, whatever. When I started to make my own films, I suddenly became an American. That was yeah. a big change in yeah. me, as I feel yeah. tied to, not to my fellow, you know, when I see yeah. people, you know, the typical American now, I don't feel one with them, but I feel one with America. There's a kind of... Gotcha. Uh, That's good. That's a good, positive thing for yes. me. Yeah, very good. Um, Joseph Boyes said, make the secrets productive. Lou Welsh said, guard the secrets, constantly, constantly reveal them. But it was Thornton Wilder in 28 who really nailed it. He said, art is confession. Art is the secret told but art is not only the desire to tell it, but it's also the desire to tell it and hide it at the same time. Right on. <laughs> I, I, the I, question was, what role does secrets play in your creative process? A lot. Yeah. I actually, because uh, uh, I don't talk about it because it's a secret. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of... Um, intensely personal things that I'm working and there's like a little pleasure at giving a clue like in other words yeah. it's not so totally sealed up in there that there would be no right. possibility of any you know so it's like you you're both expressing it and hiding it at the same time very good didn't Thornton has nailed it man with that line and right. I read that in the New York Times about two weeks ago and I go wow well, I've been waiting for this line <laughs> and uh, it's funny because uh, McLuhan also said ambiguity is a sign of human maturity uh -huh. you know and you, some people go well you're not making yourself clear well that's right. th there's a reason but also it has to be um, it's very important that because of that tension that I feel is there for the right... Yeah. You feel it, it doesn't... It's not something where there's actually a thing where somebody's going to say, oh, now we saw this letter yeah. by him, now we know that this is the thing, but it's rather something that opens up something potentially in everybody Yeah. so that it's personal to you in a different way than it is to me. It's not... You're not watching the thing in order to find out what is it really? Yeah. You know, um, because do you necessarily have to know your secret? Right. You're just trying to work it out. But it goes back to that question, can art be egoless? Can art making be egoless? One person goes, good art making is egoless. Right. That's why it's universally right. more known or accepted. But right. that's that. there's a little catch-22 in there. Right. You know. Um, and then it goes to Auden, who said it all, I think. He just nailed it better than Thornton. He says, the mystery of art is we don't know if it activates or pacifies. Huh. So it's like, you know, can this act, is this, you know, really doing, you know, anything for me? Or is, yeah. is, is, it, uh, is it just pacifying me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, can anger be a productive emotion? Yes. Yeah. Can satire be destructive? Well, satire can be stupid sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I like irony much more than satire. How do you define the difference? Well, satire is very pointed. Although, I don't know. I mean, once in a while, yeah. I usually fall asleep before I could watch uh, Saturday Night Live. Night Live. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> but I'm trying to think of what I guess it is enjoyable or yeah. something once in a while so Portlandia yeah. do you ever yeah. watch that 
I mean, so what is that? Is that satire? It is. Yeah. yeah. So it, it is. I guess I like it. I know you're getting worn out like me. You, can, you think we can go for another 10 minutes? Sure. Okay. Then I need a beer or something. Okay. Like um, uh, <laughs> on what occasion do you lie? Well, that's actually Marcel Proust's question. I'll yeah. give credit. I, I find all these questions. That are, yeah, no, yeah. Um, in this interview. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. No, Talk. but that's not true. I'm yeah. Here, but it just occurs to me. Yeah. That's irony. Uh, yeah, there you go. Right, right. Well, that's uh, Tom Waits to go. On what occasion do you lie? He goes, I didn't know I needed an occasion. <laughs> Well, it is true that you always construct something like, what is the truth? What is the truth? I mean, yeah. I mean, I suppose a lie is when you really know this is what is the real answer to this question, and yeah. I'm lying. I mean, yeah. I guess you can't. When you say something that's not really all that you could, that's not the same as lying. Yeah. I don't know why. You lie about certain things, I suppose. What's the most significant difference between men and women, uh, physical aside? Well, it's sort of, I find it's easier for me. I have it's easier to me to have friendships with women than with men. Men are more competitive, uh, so that there's always a little bit of a sense, uh, I mean, I don't feel it now, but you know, when you have friends, male friends, yeah. or, you feel at some point there's going to be this element of rivalry yeah. or power struggle or something going on where it's freer with women. So That's, that's good, because uh, I actually later on asked this question, if there's time, is what's the function of competition and is it is it inherent in us is it right. innate in us to be competitive right. probably you know that thing of survival but let's move on just got a few more here how do you find peace of mind <laughs> I'm trying to find out <laughs> I don't know Some sometimes I mean, I can't explain. It just comes upon you yeah. sometimes. That's good. If you were walking down the street today, Larry, and you met yourself as a 12-year-old, what would you say to your 12-year-old self? I don't think I can answer. I mean, I can't. Sometimes, I mean, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, that's all right. But I think of my 12-year-old self. I think I would feel so sorry for this 12-year-old self. I would, like, give him a hug and be, be, be crying. That is so touching. <laughs> I interviewed Oswald's girlfriend recently, who stayed low, and she said something like that and it made me cry. She says, I, lo I would say, I love you. Right. It's really beautiful. This one I'll, I'll point as we do. Andre Tar Tarkovsky, in a, uh, Tarkovsky to an audience at 83 Telluride Film Festival. Uh, introducing him, Stan Brackage said, I personally think there are three greatest tasks for film in the 20th century. To make the epic, that is to tell the tales of the tribe of the world. Two, to keep it personal only because only in the eccentricities of our personal lives do we have any chance at the truth. And three, to do the dream work that is to illuminate the borders of the unconscious. Any comments and what are your 21st century updates, if any?
This is so Brachygian. Like oh yeah, it's so it's so pompous. Oh, I, you know, it's so pompous. You know, sometimes people go, "That's great, I'm, yeah. I'm for," it. and then a, the last person I interview goes, "That's bullshit." <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what they, they they said a great thing. Uh, someone knew him, and he goes, "The thing that Stan would always go is my films speak on themselves." Now let me tell you for two hours what they mean. <laughs> Brachygian, and that's great. But to do the dream work that is to illuminate the borders of the unconscious, I mean, I could go something like that. I mean, yeah. To open up our inner dream world. Yeah. And the deeper thoughts that yeah. we have, the deeper experiences. I mean, sometimes it really, you know, in terms of what you said about what was it, what gives you peace of mind. Or yeah. That would, I mean, sometimes when you see a film, you're just so happy. You know, yeah. It's like, um, well, Joyce was nailed it. He said, "Find epiphanies in everydayness." Right. But I think I think the essence a lot of what I've learned from talking with you, and I really appreciate your time, was that I figure you got this interest in the deeper world from music and literature, and then you found that films you could bring it out through film because you know like you were saying these other peers of yours were getting that in painting and right. then they found film right you know and it's interesting maybe if you stayed with literature or music you would have done the thing but there's something in your pursuit of the epiphany or meaning right. you know well i brought language into it I mean, turning from, I mean, what happened is in those, that two years when I was, um, gave myself, not only in film, but I mean, I gave myself a whole art education. I mean, yeah. by going, studying, you know, standing in front of paintings, yeah. going to contemporary, th yeah. I mean, it was a very exciting time in all the different arts and yeah. whatever. Um, but uh, eventually, like, Horizons was the last film but interestingly, there was a sort of rhyme scheme that related to the rhyme scheme of a divine comedy that actually, so literature would kept into it. But after that, words have always been part of the uh, fabric of the film, as you yeah. see. In other words, there's yeah. the first these films that are silent, have nothing to do seemingly with language, and then suddenly language is a big right. part of it. Yeah. Well, let's close with this one. I really appreciate it, Larry. Um, what gives you the most optimism? I don't know. I find myself lately uh, very moved by little children. Hmm. I mean, it's something new. I mean, like, sometimes I almost, it brings tears to my eyes. I just yeah. see, like, little kids in the subway yeah. or kids walking around even in the uh, show you know where there's th thousands of people passing yeah. by all the time and I'm of course looking at the women but also when you see like a little child uh, you have a certain feeling of oh yeah whatever yeah although there was that oh well that one's still gone okay there is that fragility there also is the sadness of um, like it's interesting that in, well, in Haiti, but in Yonkers, although I live, you know, in a, very close to where I live, Yonkers is a very third world mm -hmm. place, it's so that uh, I, I, I see, I spend a lot of time with, like, black people, Hispanic people, mm -hmm. and uh, the the children are really, they're, they're beautiful. I mean, it's even beautiful to everybody because yeah. they use them in advertising. You know, these little kids are more beautiful than anybody. You know, they're, they're so yeah. fragile. And you look at them and you realize that in a few years, their lives are going to be so sad yeah. often. So there's that fragility of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it is hopeful also, I suppose. Because I don't see a lot of hope. I feel like this world is going to... Yeah. Both physically, and there's not a lot of optimism that you could feel about what's going on in the world. Yeah. 
uh, I'll end with this uh, great McLuhan. They said, uh, so, Marshall, are you an optimist or a pessimist? He goes, I'm an apocalypse. <laughs> We're fucked. <laughs> and the funny, deeper level right. is that the root word of apocalypse is to reveal. So he was just another guy like Toto pulling right. the curtain and saying, here, this right. is it. Like, the line he had was so good as this. I'm not starting the fire. I'm just turning the alarm on. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Larry. It's been an honor and a pleasure no, listen, and this is totally enlightening. Mind. You know, you are quite, I hope to get to know you, you're very well, surprised me with every question. You blew my mind. Oh, well, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much.